Welcome to the Austrian Embassy. My name is Johannes Eigner. I'm the director of the Austrian Cultural Forum. We are here tonight for a book presentation. The presentation of a book entitled They Clasp My Hand, Die Meine Hand Ergreifen. We are here tonight for a book presentation that will offer us glimpses into the life of a family and a family history that will transfer us back to the Europe of the first half of the 20th century, the life in Vienna before the Second World War, the life of a Jewish family on the eve of the Anschluss, the annexation of Austria by Hitler Germany, the tragedy of the Holocaust that showed its ugly face to this family in all its brutality, the escape of members of this family into safety, meaning into the US, and the story of a new start and of a new life. We are here together with a member of this family who is the author of the book and who has already taken a seat behind me on stage. Now please welcome with me here at the Austrian Embassy the author of the book Elizabeth Frischauf. Thank you, Elizabeth, for having made the way from New York here to the sea. Just for you to know, uh, Elizabeth has been a lifelong resident of the Upper West Side of Manhattan. She has been active as a psychiatrist, an artist, and a poet. And since the early years of this century, Elizabeth has downsized her medical practice to concentrate more on poetry, writing, and sculpturing play. And Elizabeth is also a gifted photographer. And I just encourage all of you to check on her personal website under elizabethfrischoff.com to learn more about her many artistic activities. So in a moment, Elizabeth will start her reading, and we will hear extracts of her book that was published last year. And after that, I will enter into a conversation with Elizabeth to learn more about her life, about her family. And if you so wish, you are more than welcome to tune in and ask your questions as well. And then after our conversation, Elizabeth is more than happy to provide, provide you with her book and to sign them for you. And now, it's my great pleasure to hand over to you, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Great. Hello, everyone, and welcome on such a very cold night. I want to thank the Republic of Austria, the city of Vienna, and the Austrian Cultural Forum for giving me this opportunity to be with all of you. And my publisher and editor in Vienna, Theodor Kramakolak, Konstantin Kaiser, and my New York City editor, Patricia Brody. And then my family, my friends, and all of you here, I thank. So the book, I'm, what I'm doing is, it's a narrative. I've taken selections so that you still have a sense of the story. And I will start with the epigraph, which really <coughs> continues with a theme of seeds, which comes from my great aunt, Marie Pappenheim Fischel, who is really my survivor muse, and that will come up later. Then, I, it's, the book is in two parts. The first part is after my father dies and closing up my parents' apartment, 
And then the second part explores for my new relationship to Austria and Vienna and a hopeful future. And I have dedicated the book <clears throat> to refugees everywhere so that I hope that this book will make a difference in our world for everyone. So I will start with the epigraph. Scattered seeds. Seeds flowed over the sea with sorrow and suffering. Life resumes. Young leaves, forced from mourning and misery, take root in America's earth. And then there is a fragment I will read from the prologue. From Ashes. My refugee parents taught me, you are your sister's keeper. Gather cords, frayed, this way, that way, between toes, fingers, but gather them, bind them together. Left right they say but find the rocky cleft where through blackened shards a spiky yellow dandelion grows they clasp my hand schloss all over the call in my garden tasting yellow raspberry smack in the middle of june the call comes you know it will come, yet a slop bucket sloshes over your head and you almost choke. Your pa just died. Grab my purse, leave the lakeside cottage, the blonde house, next train to Grand Central Station, subway to Broadway in 79, dash to Riverside Drive in 78, catch my breath in the elevator going up enter my parents' apartment, an orphan, no longer a child. He is laid out on my mother's side of the bed where she died two years ago, unwilling to let go of 98 years. One week after we celebrate my 64th, a slice of birthday cake, her last meal. <clears throat> Pa's wide, strong hands Freckles faded yellow, veins flat. Once rivers of busy use folded watchfully on his shrunken chest. Oh, pause all I can say. Soothe his bold, still slightly warm, domed head. A few hours later, I return to rain. A flower pot sits in sympathy on the lounge house doorstep. Pa's spirit hovers, grateful hummingbird, heady with fresh lily nectar. Night falls swift and dark. Moonlight drowses on the lake beyond we all love so well. A firefly brushes my head where Pa stroked his crying little girl my pa will spend the night in its garden, he and I love so well. A candle in the window lights the night. By morning, pa is gone. Save everything. Time to close up 40 years of my parents' life in this apartment. What will I find? <clears throat> my father, his photo, must be 16, catches my eye. Strapping, six foot tall, open faced guy. I know he was strong. Five years old, hauled coal buckets up five flights, swam, hiked, or skied every weekend bicycled old crooked streets all over Vienna, which he never forgot. U.S. Army dog tags rest in a field of stapler refills, paper clips, 
their border marked by his prized plastic slide rule. Deep in the drawer's corner, a Japanese lacquer box, two lucky cranes streaking over a full moon on its clamped cover. Under that black lacquer box, a fat black swastika, Pa's German passport cover, he never showed me. I start to piece the puzzle. March 12, 1938. Leg up, straight leg, arm up, arrow shaft, right arm, C, C, Heil, Hitler swarms Austria. March 13, Pa walks the Albert Gasse to his technical gymnasium. <clears throat> Their Führer's portrait blazes over twisted black crosses. A new teacher shoves Pa. There, your classroom for Jews and Michelins, half-Jews. Pa is now dirty, a target for toughs to curse and beat him. Police cheering them on. Day by day, Nazi racial laws clobber Germany's acquired fork. I meet Pa's aunt Laura, his mother's youngest sister, for the first time on a page in his memoirs, drowning in a folder sunk in a stuffed file drawer. She was scraping by as a French teacher in a secretarial school, a Jewess dismissed. She is the one who taught Pa French so he could impress clients later on. Can you test if this rope on the safety belt will hold me? I might as well clean the windows, she asks Pa, the family handyman, engineer to be. Laura hangs herself. Her neck was so long, don't go to see her. Before she's cremated, Clara, his mother, tells him. Can one ever forget? Pa writes 70 years later. Clara, his mother, respected, valued insurance claims officer for the huge Mannheimer Versicherungsgesellschaft, another Jewess, forced to retire. Every morning, each afternoon, Pa, with blowtorch teenage intensity, tries to melt her marble resolve against a friend's visa offer to save her. I cannot leave my last remaining sister, and besides, my pension comes in. It does. That pension, like a monthly IV drip to death, continues up through their deportation to Auschwitz in 1943. <clears throat> doors open, doors close. Have you ever listened to the sound of a hollow, a solid wood door? Wondered, do they open on the underworld or the palm of heaven? In true Viennese fashion, Ma's medical office study is a sequestered room in this sprawling apartment. Weekday pulse, clap, clap, patient's leather soles on foyer linoleum. Tap, tap, Ma's low heels. Doors open, doors close. Two mothers, Ma and medical doctor Ma, Keen neurologist, psychoanalyst, kind teacher to me, psychiatrist yet to be in the kitchen, or her medical residence at the teaching hospital. We listen, learn. Like all people, some patients are nice and others not so nice. Because a patient is psychotic, does not mean he or she is immoral or will kill or steal. When I am a graduated psychiatrist and try to share my knowledge, family therapy, a mainly American idea, new medications, 
she remains in Vienna with her many Nobel Prize winning professors, venerated Professor Tumbler, who drew the human body with both hands at once. Not so much went wrong in life for you, she flings the long bone of her finger that holds war goodbyes too wrenching to count. <clears throat> Nineteen fifty six, our first trip home. From Idlewild Airport, our takeoff whirs through red and white cloth curtained windows. My brother and I visit the pilot's cabin. Glowing knobs, winking dials, green and red indicator dots. We sit on his lap inside a bowl of stars. Early 1900s Vienna-style apartment building on the Archplasse. Up four winding flights of marble stairs, expectant heavy wood double door claps open like a giant clam. Is this what it feels like to be hugged by an octopus? In New York, it's only four of us. Sempus. Hello, hello. Great Aunt Mitzi, her son Hans, Helene and his wife, their children, Anamali, nine, like me, Heinrich, seven, just like my brother, and Frau Yeshek, royal nanny housekeeper, surround us. The grown-ups lapse into Viennese. Hopes of array, we four kids race. Fast, dizzy, faster loops around the eight-foot mahogany table. Off-duty now. Later, Helena's family practice patients will sit, hear, wait, chat, and knit. Sunday, we play hide-and-seek in the Vienna woods, climb to the Kogensel Terrace restaurant, and stuff ourselves like other Viennese families. The stool drenched in vanilla sauce. Pa and Ma beam. Point over the woods, the vineyards. Look, down there, the Stephansdom, the city's heart. No building can be higher than its spire. Ma's cheeks glisten. Pa grins, big ear to big ear. Every day, Ma's steady smile. Pa's feet on wings. We're on a magic carpet through streets they remember so well. The grim past temporarily vanished. We can't get enough. Too soon, the trip to our Austrian homeland is over. The letters. We are from the time of postcards and letters, bundles sheathed with broken, gooey rubber bands. On the bottom bookcase shelf, boxes and boxes, split valiant containers of too much, labeled Muti, Papa, miscellaneous. Muti's letters. Have you ever held tissue-thin pages that tremble with your breath, that float as you turn them over? A riot of rose blooms collaged on a plastic binder cover conceal three years of letters between Ma and Muti, my grandmother hated, who could not leave. Her quota number, too high. She must return to her birth country, Germany, and her brother-in-law and sister's house, three trapped Jews. Aided waits, waits and hopes for that visa, that affidavit to bring her safe to her daughter in America. Twist, turn, yes, no, it's coming, but the Nazis want more money. Ma has the affidavit, 
borrows money for the ship's ticket, but the German exit visa clearing office closes for months. Mail delivery to Jews cut. Swallowed tears fleck the room. I strain to see nothing beyond that swollen purple space round my eyes. Each letter from aid, it says, you will see, all will turn out good and beautiful for us. Ma's birthday, May 22nd, 1941, Aidit writes, I found the clover leaf on your birthday. We'll wait and hope. Each letter pales, distance stretches, Aided, hunted, the game always changes. She'll need luck, lots of it, to escape. April 1943, letter addressed, Spring Grove Hospital, Maryland, where Ma staff psychiatrist. Rather than be taken to a concentration camp, your mother took Veronal with her sister and brother-in-law. She sank into peace, your photograph on her lap. I hear my mother's strangled voice. I could never raise enough money to rescue my mother. She wasn't Jewish enough as a Protestant half-Jew for the U.S. Hebrew agencies to help, and then it was too late. Schluss, all over. Box, a hundred years of letters stack into my shopping cart. Blank shelves and walls stare. A last wink of sun sparks across the Hudson River. The tired apartment heaves a vast gush of stale air. I turn the lock. It shivers for the last time as the bolt drops. Boxes. Wing side seat, airplane engine roar. Lullabies, clouds, ashes, remains. On the way to Vienna, far away. Memory mind box was never said. Who is it, photos? Box closes. Another box. An undo box. Wreathed in net, snagged on deep ocean crag. All are up. Sides splay. Corners gush water. Free my soul with fair souls. Fly home. A bower above the clouds, love lulling lullabies explode. Return to the Lund House. May 22nd, Ma's birthday. The garden hung with scent. Lily of the Valley. Her favorite flower waited as it must to bloom. I returned, mother, to warm earth, grass refusing silence. I lie naked, sag breast, slack belly, meld into fresh mon clover, my inside, outside, one. <coughs> I return to these letters at 72, ready at last. I will organize, <coughs> sort, scan. I who still carry the terror of a right shout. Eight pages catch my eye. Ma, at 72, begins in English. Some of my experiences and feelings will die with me. I loved Vienna really like a person. 
the city of laughter and tears, of old and new beauty. Thinking about my life, there was a lot of emotional suffering and pain and a lot of physical illnesses, but the joy prevailed. On page seven, she must switch to German. Thanks, Sophie on the end of I think so much about my parents, she writes, and I think the same with her. If only Mom had told me how the murder, suicide, genocide that curated her life began to ebb. Can it be if you live long enough, the Holocaust loses its stranglehold and fades? We flowed between two languages, translated ourselves along the way. My every fiber soaked with you. I must go ahead with my flow. I, who still carry the terror, must write, summon, wake up. A river will out. You can't contain it. A poem will out. You can't restrain it. My grandson waits in the garden for morning sun. A crow calls, fly on today's wind, swim on the lip of the universe. Then, eyes darting from face to face, lands on the table. Hey, Grandma, she's taken your toast. Grandmother land, American-born children, grandchildren and I, alive to hold their hands. The truth is out. You cannot tame it. about my 
my mother's father, my grandfather, is that because he attended Freud's groups on Wednesday, he had his groups where they would discuss psychoanalytic theories. Although a neurologist, he was very influenced by that. And you can read the interviews online in English or German. And he asks about this young man's childhood and what made him do it. And it's really the portrait of a terrorist could be a terrorist today. So my mother grew up in this atmosphere of science, um, all kinds of intellectual ferment. After the war, it was a time of, as I said, starvation, wounded, walking the streets, massive immigration from the broken down empire coming from the east, from the shells, from the ghettos. And so Vienna was faced with a huge homeless refugee problem and elected a socialist government and entered an era which is called Red Vienna. So my mother was a young woman growing up in that time and her aunt, my great aunt Mitzi, my survivor news, was very active in that. So it was a very exciting time to be young then and to be part of all of these attempts to solve these big social problems, major architects, artists, musicians, and my mother also went to a very unusual school, which was run by a very strong feminist lady. So she had physics and chemistry and subjects which normally weren't taught to women. <clears throat> my father was born, was younger than my mother, was born in 1921. So he didn't have already the first world war under his belt, so to speak, but um, time he grew up was also then a coming depression, massive disruptions, and the rise of, really strong rise of fascism in Austria. And he always told us he would have left even without the Nazis because he felt he wouldn't have a place in such a hierarchical society. He knew from a young age he wanted to be an engineer, and that's why he went to the technical gymnasium and was always tinkering and fixing everything at home. His, my, both my parents were children of divorce. Uh, my mother's father married for a third time a Zionist and went to Palestine in 1933 where he was promised to be head of the neurology department they were forming a medical school there. He didn't get that, but his sister, my great aunt, Mami Papana Mitzi, he called her, who was a Stalinist, told him, you must not come back, you will be arrested and go to jail. So my mother's father actually remained in Palestine and then died there of lung cancer. And when my mother was dismissed, she went to medical school, studied psychoanalysis, had a job, and with Anschluss, she was immediately dismissed as a half Jew. And she knew she would have to leave, as, as did my father after being in the school. And so, to go into my mother's story, my mother wrote to her father, who was a very eminent, world-renowned neurologist, and he wrote letters all over Switzerland, Sweden, the United States, and was finally able to get a job for her at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And she was able to get an affidavit because you could not easily enter the United States. You had to have an affidavit, and then you had to have proof that you would have work so that you wouldn't be on the dole. So she was able to get that, and her route out of Austria was she went to say goodbye to her father. The visa was waiting in Jerusalem. And then she had to snake back from Tel Aviv to Trieste and to Marseille. And then the boat that she took uh, left boulogne sur mer And then it made one more stop in Southampton. And then it came to what I found out when I was 
having questions for the book that I had no answers to. I thought that she'd come to Ellis Island to find out in the New York Public Library that they have all the ship's manifests that she landed in Hoboken in December. Oh, and then three days later, she took a Greyhound bus to Baltimore. My father was already, because he had a German passport, and he hadn't finished in Mazio, finished his half year, and then he was able somehow to tell the government that he needed to visit his sick aunt in Paris. The sick aunt is my great aunt, Mitzi. So a little backstory there. She and my father's uncle were married, so that tied the two families together in that generation. And she was an ardent Stalinist. Her husband was not Jewish, and they divorced because she thought nothing would happen to him, and she thought she would be safe going to Paris, where she was a dermatologist. She could start a practice. So she went to Paris, and her husband was arrested as a suspected communist, put into Buchenwald, where he contracted tuberculosis and practically died, and he was eventually let out to die. And this great uncle of mine has had a history already in World War I. He was a doctor in the Austrian army, and he was in the Russian front, and he was taken prisoner of war in Russia and sent to Siberia, where he was a, used as a prison doctor. And I don't know how, but his family story is that in Dr. Zhivago, he walked back to Vienna. And he, my mother said he was never the same. Well, my father was able to visit his so-called sick aunt in Paris. He had a visa and an affidavit to some distant relatives in Chicago. So he, from Paris, went to Rotterdam, took the ship. And it seems so strange to be talking about taking ships, but there were no airplanes then. So he took the ship and then went to Chicago to meet these residents, these uh, cousins. And you could only have $20 to come into the United States, so every last penny went to the bus ticket and having maybe a few small meals along the way. And so my father went to Illinois. <coughs> he went to, he, um, enrolled in the University of Illinois to study electrical engineering. And then, while he was in his training, Pearl Harbor happened, and he became, from one day to the next, an enemy alien, because he had a German passport. And he wanted to enlist, and they said to him, wait until you're drafted. And he was drafted enemy alien, and got his citizenship that way, and was sent to the Pacific Theater where he was in the Signal Corps, and then he was one of the first troops to go to Japan with MacArthur, and that's where the Japanese lacquer box in his drawer comes from. Then my parents had known each other. I hope this isn't too complicated. <laughs> The, the two grandmothers were best friends. My mother, being older than my father, would sometimes babysit for my father, so they knew each other in that way. But then when my father mustered out and was dumped in Seattle because he was in the Pacific Theater, he didn't know anybody, he didn't know what he was going to do with his life, but. He had been in touch with my mother, who was in New York. She left Baltimore after she redid all her medical exams and came to New York, where there were many emigre psychoanalysts. Called her on the phone and said, can I come and stay with you until I figure out what I want to do? So he stayed. Then they got married, and a year later I was born. 
And then two years later, my brother was born. So I don't know. <laughs> I see. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's just fascinating to see and to hear how the twists uh, in, in, in your family's history and, and it's kind of hard to believe, I have to say. Um, in your book, you describe your father as a hard man to love. Uh, and about your mother, your mother became a prominent psychiatrist, um, as you told us, stemming from a traditional Jewish family of prominent doctors. And you write in your book, when she died, he, meaning your father, became a clock without hands. What was it like for them, starting afresh in the US, being refugees to America's liberty, and strange in English, no matter how well they learned it, to paraphrase from your book. How was it for them to re-establish themselves, given this very European background? Well, I, I think part of it was easier, because New York City is that kind of a place where you can be from any place, and it's okay in a sense. Uh, there are just so many people from other places. And there was an emigre community, and there was a community of psychoanalysts from my mother. My father really was very isolated. And my father's personality was very compartmentalized, and he never really dealt with the trauma. I never knew what happened to his mother. He never said, and I guess you, you learn not to ask questions, and somehow I thought, well, maybe she died of old age. And then suddenly, one day, I was visiting them. I was in my 40s. And there was a concert on the radio for Pascalnik, and he just blurted out, my mother went to Auschwitz. That was the first time I heard it. And he was like that. He would just have these explosions. And he was very patriotic about the United States. He loved the United States. He often spoke in some ways disparagingly about Austria. My mother was all nostalgia. She wanted to go back. And it was not so much for Austria, the state. It was really more for Vienna, which she said, Vienna was like a person. And I've heard this from others. Um, Edmund Duval, who wrote The Hair with the Amber Eyes, he, he in an interview he says, I must go back to Vienna just to walk the streets. There's something about Vienna which is like that. So it was very hard for them. We were very isolated. We had no cousins, nobody. My great aunt, I don't know if I should go into that story. <laughs> My great aunt, as I said, went to Paris where she thought, I'm fine. Along comes Vichy government, and she's rounded up and sent to a camp in the Pyrenees called Gurs, which was a holding camp, to be sent to the east. The Germans hadn't quite taken over France yet, so somehow the communists were able to bribe her out, and the Mexican president, Lázaro Cárdenas, gave thousands of visas and she got one, and she went to Mexico City. And my father, when he came over, he visited her there before he went off to the Pacific Theater. And she, after the war, went back. And so, and she wrote poetry when she was in the camp. And there was, there's a little collection of her, of a book of hers, and there are poems from the camp. And when I was 12 years old, her book is on the bookshelf. And I started reading them, and I thought, this is, you can write poetry you know, in a prison behind barbed wire. I just thought, this is, this is incredible. And I always wanted to sit on a bookshelf next to her. And by happenstance, my publisher, which is a, a very amazing publishing house that was set up after the war, for exiled writers who came back to have a place to publish, and that included my great aunt. One of her books was published by the same publisher. So there are these wonderful things that happen too. So um, I don't know 
know where I was going. I got kind of off track a little bit. Talking about your parents, but I could now wish to shift to you, Kelly, because you were growing up in the US uh, after the Second World War in a, in a family of parents that were so heavily involved by their European heritage. So now they coming from the old world, you growing up in the new world, how did that go? I mean, to start with, uh, in which language did your parents communicate? Well, when, before my brother was born, I always spoke in German, so I became bilingual. When my brother was born, I don't know why, they, they spoke German at home between themselves, but increasingly they switched to English, and my brother never really learned German, and so if it was the four of us, we spoke English. Uh, and I learned, that, and also, we did have some family left, and this first trip home was really an amazing trip because then I met my great aunt, her son, his wife, and they had two children the same age as really as me and my brother. So finally, the first time we had a family. So they would send books in German, which I learned to read. I have a lot of vintage children's books in German. And the strange thing is, though, they never thought to send us to learn German, like children went to Hebrew school. We, we never were sent to learn German in any formal way. So what I picked up was mainly from reading and hearing, so my grammar is not so great. And it, it was, I, but I, I think I, I just see the apartments. The apartment was very much like an old world, Annie's apartment. And I grew up in a building which was built in 1911, so they had high ceilings, large rooms. So it, in that way, it was very much like the older apartments in Vienna. And even though all the furniture and everything they had was from the States, it was still very much in that style. And then in 1956, when we went back, my mother's nanny housekeeper had been asked to save. They had a lot of beautiful antiques and a palace chandelier. And she saved some of it. And my father bargained with her. He said, look, you know, if you don't want that old thing, I'll buy you a new fixture. And he had it dismantled and shipped to the United States. So then we had this incredible, my daughter's here, she knows, the chandelier, hanging in the dining room. And then they started collecting all of these little angels, little Baroque angels, which are all over the wall. And so, I mean, I was out there in New York, and New York at the time was transforming into a more there was a large influx of Puerto Ricans from Puerto Rico, and a large influx of kind of more of a Spanish, lively vibe to New York, which was so different from my parents. So in a way, I have this duality. We had, for birthdays, we always had a traditional birthday cake. We had a Christmas tree with candles. We made a cookie house every year. My mother was very fond of wearing the traditional dress, the gimbal, because also when she grew up, there was very much a thrust to collecting the folk songs and folklore and having youth trips to the mountains and wearing the, the gimbal. So my home was kind of an old world home. And then when her analyst friends came, they spoke mainly German and they were European. And my mother would bake a traditional cake. And so this, I, when I left the home, I was in a different milieu. And then when I came to the home, I was in another milieu. So. Um, you shortly alluded to, to your parents' approach to the post-war Austria, and you telling us that your father was a 
like a drug, like a US American citizen and having, like put it, my mixed feelings about Austria, whereas her mother rather being nostalgic but more about Vienna than, 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 than Austria as I understand it. And for me, interesting to, to hear your first trip back home, as you call it, to Austria, and obviously the strong emotions that, what the, that attracted with your, with your parents. Uh, now coming to you personally, uh, how would you describe your approach to the Austria of today? And I think you give a hint in your book uh, when you write about your father, and I'm a quote, you write, he, meaning your father, becomes an American citizen and he decides his given name, casts out the C from his family name Frisch Auf. Now, Frisch Auf, he separates himself from what's left on the other side of the Atlantic. I, meaning you, will put back the cast out C into my family's name so the books I write could stand with great I think that's interesting and telling. And another thing, uh, you told me when we talked uh, yesterday that you accepted Austrian citizenship already years ago. Um, given the fact what happened to your family, why is that? Well, one, one thing is that there is the language and I had no other culture except what my parents brought to us. And when we went back, there was family which we didn't have in the United States. And so that was really very, that, that meant that I couldn't be in one place and not the other in a certain way. And then, When reparations came, I think it was in the late 80s, early 90s, that really made a tremendous difference. Uh, and so I think one has to really think, I mean, the word means to repair. And that made a big difference. And then the offer for citizenship. And one thing I, I feel in a survivor family, a refugee family, is always a little bit in the back of my mind, you know, do I have to pack the suitcase? What do I need just in case? It's always a little thought. It's better if I have to leave, I have another place to go. And with Austria being in the European Union, that means more than one country. So that was part of it too. <laughs> it's always the, the thought, and, and I had nightmares as a child. My, my parents were very good in that way, unlike some families where it was drummed in, you know, yes, they said you have it better than we have, but they didn't dwell so much on the horror and what happened. They kind of avoided a lot of that, for which I'm very grateful. But I would have nightmares, somehow I absorbed anyway, that there'd be a knock on the door. And at that time, I thought, well, I could hide under my bed. Now, if the cell phone is out, you can't hide anywhere, <laughs> which is a thought, crazy thought, but I have thoughts like that. And then uh, we went back to Austria more times. And then my father felt my daughter should learn German. So he paid for her to go to summer camps in Austria to learn German. So then we were there together. And she met her generation of cousins from the children of cousins who are my generation. And so the connection is built. And the other thing is, when I'm in Vienna, I, I just feel like I'm at home. I know the city. My mother would take me on her route from where she lived in Vienna to her school, and then she took me and my daughter along that route to where her school was. So all these places have a meaning to me, not from a brochure or a tourist thing, but they're very real to me. 
And there just is something about the food agrees with me. I mean, I, I think over generations there, there's something genetic too that gets into the system. And before the age of mass clothing from China, I, I could walk in a store, something would fit me, the colors were right for me. So there are all these things which are inescapable, I believe. And um, I feel very fortunate that I, I wasn't cut off completely from my origins. But um, what I realize now, especially with writing the book, so a very interesting occurrence for me was I, I couldn't, I was writing years before, and there's some older poems which I reworked, but I could not put the book together while my father was still alive. He died two years after my mother. There's something about when a person who's gone through that is physically with you, even though he will make his jokes and laugh and not go into things, there's just something in the body that's there that you experience. I don't know if you felt that with them. But um, until he died, I, I couldn't have enough distance to really put the book together. And now when I go back, I feel like the city is mine. It's not my parents' city. I, it's not my city, too. I have a different relationship to it. And having my publisher there, and friends there, and family also, younger family. Uh, before I ask you to get ready for your questions, I will uh, ask my last question to you. Uh, now fast forward, uh, Elizabeth, you have raised two children, and we have the pleasure to have one of them, your daughter, with us tonight. We are really, really honored and to have you here as well. You also have grandchildren, and you have written this book, uh, which at first sight very much revolves around topics of the past, what happened to you, to your family, but I think it also holds messages for the future. And uh, your book ends with the chapter, My Grandson Waits, and you, you read the last lines, and I just repeat them. Grandmother land, American-born children, grandchildren, and I, alive to hold their hands. The truth is out, you cannot stain it. So now, which truth is out? What's the message? What are the messages you wish to convey in your book to future generations? Well, I mean, messages. <laughs> That's one, one very important message is that you don't really know what you will do or what you will happen when faced with these circumstances. And somehow, if there is personal courage and strength that you can brag from somewhere, that, that makes a big difference. And, and I feel that's really what was more than anything transmitted to me. Although, at the same time, I grew up with, would I know what to do? Would I leave in time? Would I be able to manage? And they were, in a sense, heroic in that way. So the message is, and there's so many refugees in the world every day, all the time, repetitions of this kind of gruesome need to invade countries and do horrible things, and now we have weapons that can do it on such a mass scale. So I would like the message also to be that we really have to be mindful, we have to be compassionate that people have different ways of dealing with being alive in the world, but we do have to be open to what systems do and what they say and all the different messages we get and not sit back and just say, oh, no, you know, that's some crazy group over there. We have to be more vigilant and active and tell the stories, and it has
has to be personal. If it's all kind of abstract or if it, but I don't think it works, it has to be personal. And my own feeling from having read my great aunt's poetry is that uh, I think poetry is one one very powerful way because you have emotion in the words and it's stripped down in a certain way. It's more stark. You can do things in poetry which are different. So I feel that's very important too. The spoken word, the word that's allowed, these kinds of gatherings, and the personal. Otherwise, it's so easy to forget that, you know, you hear statistics, you know, maybe you love this building, and, you, you, and then you forget these are human beings. This is very personal. And then I did not grow up with grandparents. I had no grandparents. So to be able to have grandchildren and be there with them is, is such a wonderful thing. So that is very important too. It's important if you are a grandparent to do your very best to be with your grandchildren. Thank you. I would now wish to open up the discussion or, or giving you the opportunity to ask your questions. Um, if you have any, just raise uh, your hands. Please, wait in front. Thank you so much for your talk. Could you explain or share some of the poets who inspired you? There's so many poets. Uh, of the American poets, uh, Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson, H.D. Uh, I'm so good with names. There's so many more. Those are the ones that come to the top of my mind. Then there's Liv Gillen, and then because music was so important in my family, and also that's so important to a Viennese family. I grew up listening to Schubert songs, so all the poetry, Goethe, all the poetry he used, Heine, all that are in my head, really from Schubert songs. So I have that, and uh, Auden, and uh, Yeats, and well, Shakespeare, of course. <laughs> you have to mention Shakespeare. Uh, I don't know. More will come to me. Thank you. Yes. Mine is not a question, just a comment. First of all, I want to thank you for sharing your personal story, because while listening to your story, I was reliving my parents' story. And what you said about going back to Vienna, that's exactly how I feel when I walk around Vienna. I lived in Washington around the globe, but Vienna will always be my home because of my parents, what they instilled in me. So while listening to your personal story, I could connect you as like a parallel. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes, thank you also. Also comments are most welcome. Please go ahead. Thank you. I also want to say thank you for sharing your story. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question is how, we heard a lot about your parents' story. I would like to know how your parents' story shaped your life and maybe your daughter's life. Like what decisions, how do you think your decision making changed or your profession that you chose, is that connected in some way, how you made your life choices based on your story and your parents' story? Well, one thing, uh, my parents always were very aware. They, they were not people who were very dogmatic and closed into one way of looking at things. And they were always looking kind of at systemic way of 
how a little thing happening somewhere could then cascade into more things. And I, that influenced me a lot. Uh, I'm always thinking and kind of trying to put things together in a bigger way. And then my interest in psychiatry, which is going deeper inside, and particularly uh, family therapy is a way of looking at a system and how people influence, influence each other and scapegoat. And then on a bigger scale, that plays out politically. So that definitely influenced me. And not being willing to put up with necessarily what one is told and that, that that's the truth and that's the way it is. Um, and then in, in because I'm also by genes lucky that I'm artistic and visual, what I can't say in words than I choose to do in visual arts. And in photography, what I do particularly is make collages. So I'll see different things and then stitch them together. And so actually, I think I am a collage person myself. <laughs> so I am personally a collage in many ways. So that's reflected in then my worldview and what I do with it. I don't know if my daughter is here. If you want to say something. I can't speak for how she, how she's influenced by it. Well, um, one thing my mother didn't mention is that um, the maternal side of my family all lived within 20 New York blocks of one another, so we were incredibly, incredibly close, and I was very close with my grandparents, um, particularly with my grandfather, mostly because my grandmother was a lot older by the time I was a mature adult, and he had a lot of influence in the way that I looked at the world and how I made decisions as an adult. Um, in particular, uh, my politics, he definitely always instilled in me the concept of the silent majority, and that it wasn't the Nazis only. It was the people that stood by, and in fact, there was a, a story that my grandmother told me uh, around the time I was in high school that really hit home. She told us the story, my mother and I, the story of um, the night of the Anschluss, and that every single one of her neighbors had a Nazi flag ready in their apartment and hung it outside of the window. And so that struck us the silent majority, uh, the willingness of so-called good people to stand by, not only do nothing, but participate. Um, so it's influenced my politics. It's influenced what I do for a living. I work for the US government, and uh, he was always very, very um, pushy <laughs> about whatever career path I chose, that it should be an active one, and that I should be whatever I cared about or whatever I wanted to do, that it should be for good and, and for the greater good. Um, and I think more than anything, um, it, it caused me to think about, I guess I'm not religious, but there but the grace of God go I. It, it could have, just as easily worked out differently for my family. And so, um, I mean, I, I was talking to these lovely ladies behind me, and I was actually raised in part by, uh, by a Latino community, because I grew up in New York, and I feel a very, very strong connection to the Latino community and what's going on right now at the border, for example. A huge connection to the way that this country sees immigrants now and the cruelty, just incredible cruelty that is going on with immigration in our own country and the fact that my grandparents were immigrants and were a lucky few immigrants and now we have essentially closed our borders 
and have, um, are repeating past mistakes. So it, it certainly has influenced um, my life in many, many ways, and I'm, I'm droning on, but um, I think what my mother said about her truth and, and, and wanting people to think about these things at a personal level, um, I guess the last thing that, that I will just say is, is the concept of you know, never forget. Right? If we don't keep telling these stories, we already know people are trying to forget. They're actively trying to forget. So never forget. I think this perfectly concludes what you have said. This perfectly concludes uh, our evening. And if you agree, I do. Um, I definitely do. I'm a very proud mother. <laughs> and on this on this note, I say thank you first of all You're to welcome. you yeah. for having made the journey from New York to DC, to the Austin Embassy, to read uh, from your book, to share your thoughts and your emotions. And also a great big thank you to all of you for being with us tonight. And Please stay in touch with us and, and keep uh, coming to the Austrian Embassy for events we have, whatever it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.